This episode is brought to you by the new true crime docuseries, American Nightmare, only on Netflix. In 2015, the Vallejo, California Police Department received a strange phone call about a kidnapping. But when the truth is stranger than fiction, you won't know who to trust or what is real. A fast-paced true crime thriller with cliffhangers at every turn. Watch American Nightmare now, only on Netflix. He'd been planning this. But the only reason to kill the kids is so they didn't have to go on in life with a divorced family. I want him to be alive. I want to be, be able to bring him to justice and bring closure to this case. I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't think he was still alive. I'm going to assume he's still alive. He's got a new life, new family. You think he has a new family? Potentially, yeah. Yeah. 50-50, he's alive. You never do know who your neighbors are. This is True Crime Arizona, Finding Robert Fisher, in Arizona's Family Originals podcast. It was just several months ago at the end of April. Sergio and I were just wrapping up recording a podcast episode with a former homicide detective, completely unrelated to the Robert Fisher case. Right before he leaves, we tell him we're working on our Fisher investigation and he tells us about a big possible tip, something we had definitely never heard before. He couldn't remember the exact address, but he owned a house up in Sholo and remembered at a home near his, the little blue house on the corner, the owner was assaulted by somebody coming out of a wooded area asking for money, and the detective believed it was right around the time the search for Robert Fisher was at its peak, not far from there. I got excited. This tip was so unexpected and I was going to do all the digging to find out everything I could about it. If there was an assault, it was likely on record with a police or sheriff's department. The detective gave me his old Sholo home address. So I went to Google Earth to see if I could find a nearby blue house on the corner. Bingo, found it right away. I had my assignment editor, Sean, look up that address on LexisNexis and it showed a previous owner by the name of Gene Wilde, who had since died in 2014. I texted the detective and asked if that name rang a bell. Right away, he said, yep, that's it. Oftentimes when we want police records or a case report, we have to file a Freedom of Information Act request, known as a FOIA. I wasn't sure if this assault was filed with the Sholo Police Department or the Navajo County Sheriff's Office, so I filed a FOIA with both. I got a response back. Navajo County Sheriff's Office sent me the report. We're going to read you most of the summary of the assault report with the address kept private just for privacy reasons to those who live there now. This is what some of it said. I received a call in reference to an assault that occurred at in Sholo, Arizona. Upon my arrival to the residence, I was met by Gene Wilde, the victim. Gene stated that while he was in his studio, he noticed a man walking across his property from the west. He then met the man outside and asked what he wanted. The man stated that he wanted some money. Gene told the man that he would hire him to do yard work. The man replied by telling Gene to off. Gene then told the man to leave. The man pushed Gene and then punched him in the head. Gene then fell to the ground head first. Gene stated that by the time he could get up, the unidentified man was walking toward the street. Gene stated that he had never seen the man before. Gene described the man as being tall but slender. He was wearing green colored jeans and a yellow cutoff shirt. Gene thought that the man was in his late 20s. The suspect was not located at that time. Okay, so the late 20s description would definitely be too young for Robert Fisher. He was 40 when he disappeared. But other than that, tall, slender, those were characteristics that did fit Robert. And the fact that Gene called authorities right away and two officers who searched the area couldn't find this guy, yeah, that sounded like Robert Fisher too, eluding authorities. He was good at that. According to the documents that were sent to me, that man was never found, even to this day. But there was one glaringly obvious part of this report that told me there was no way that was Robert Fisher. The date. The assault is dated August 14, 2000. That was eight months before the Fisher family murders and home explosion. The detective's memory was just a bit off on the timeline. If anything, though, I could credibly rule that tip out for good, knowing I tracked it down to the source and vetted it out. 
And that's just as important as I and Scottsdale PD continue to get new information and tips coming in from our podcast listeners and TV viewers. It's all part of the investigation process. Halfway through this podcast series, one of Robert Fisher's sisters, Jean, reached out to me on Facebook and we talked on the phone for an hour and a half. The family has been listening to the podcast, including her, her other sister, and their mom. To be honest, I figured their family wouldn't like that I was doing this investigation, but to my surprise, it was the opposite. Jean is very kind, and you can only imagine the absolute pain the rest of the Fisher family has felt since this happened. Confusion mixed with anger, mixed with grief. Mary was Jean's sister-in-law, and Brittany and Bobby were her niece and nephew. While she didn't want her face or voice on camera, she did give me permission to relay some thoughts she has, things that give new information we learned in this investigation much more context. She said out of the three siblings, herself, her sister, and Robert, Robert did take their parents' divorce the hardest, and she could imagine him saying divorce would not be on the table for his own family, However, she could not imagine him choosing murder over divorce, at least not the Robert she knew. Those Mexico tip lookalike pictures, she hadn't seen those yet and saw them for the first time in my journal online that go along with each episode. She at first thought that was legitimately her brother. She said two out of three of them looked so similar, she truly believed it could have been him and felt emotion just seeing those pictures. Authorities have ruled out that tip after they found the man in the photos. Retired detective TJ Duran had said in his interviews with coworkers and friends of Robert Fisher, they didn't say anything about him spelunking or going caving, so he does not believe Robert was ever in the caves. Gene says he actually did that quite a bit before he joined the military, which would have been primarily down in Tucson. She said Robert loved it, so now we know he did have experience doing that. Jean felt that Jesse Klingbeil's story and tip at the Cherry Creek store in Young could very well be true, that Robert Fisher could have been living on an old man's ranch in Northeast Arizona. Because that old man came into the store with an oxygen tank, Jean says it makes sense Robert would help somebody like that. His career was as a respiratory therapist at Mayo Clinic. At this point, Jean hopes Robert is dead. She says if he is found alive, there's no doubt he committed this horrible crime, and she fears if he is alive that she and her family are in danger. She says if he's dead, she still believes there's a chance somebody else was targeting him and the family, and he may have been killed after the other three. Jean and her family have chosen to forgive Robert, because they can't live with the burden of anger. They do think if he did this, he snapped and had a mental breakdown, that it wasn't premeditated. Jean keeps Robert's old Bible in her nightstand. While we were on the phone, she opened it up to a page where Robert had scribbled down some notes. He wrote, how to know right from wrong. Mexico, Canada, the UK, Brooklyn, New York. His dad is in Florida. From Florida, Texas, up into the Northeast, into Washington. I remember Guatemala. We've received some things from Europe, Scottsdale and the Phoenix area, from Payson and Sholo. Of all the places from every corner of the world where tips have come in, the reality is the story ends where it nearly began, in the woods in young Arizona. All we know for sure, all investigators know for sure, is Robert Fisher walked away from his car and left his dog, Blue. What drives the mystery of his disappearance even more is the seemingly 50-50 split on whether people involved in this case believe Robert Fisher is dead or still alive and what on earth his motive could have been, especially to kill his children, Brittany and Bobby. Detective Hugh Lockerby gives details on the only plausible motive investigators have been able to come up with. Do you feel you've gotten the answer as to why he did this? No, no, not yet. I mean, I can, I can guess, I can give you my opinion, but- What I, is it? 
Well, I mean... I'm interested to know. You're interested to know. So I guess the question is, why did he do this, right? Is mm-hmm. that your question? Yeah. Because I have a different... I mean, I kind of go back and forth as to the why, because it's an unknown answer. Um, so I, I think, you know, he was very controlling. Um, his worlds were crashing. They were closing in. He started this plan of moving on with his life, but not having his kids well he didn't want his kids to grow up living the life that he did with because he his parents separated so that's always been given to us from interviews as to why he would have done this robert fisher's parents were divorced and he told his friends he would not have his kids grow up in a divorced family in a sick and twisted way if his marriage was crumbling and the family dynamic was cracking Some believe he killed his kids so they wouldn't have to grow up in a broken family. Mental health had played, obviously has to play a role in this. I mean, now that we know a lot more about mental health, you know, he had the back pain. Um, He was taking oxycodone. Did that alter his mental state? And where he's not the normal person? I don't know enough about that to really speak intelligently about it. But I mean, so all these different factors played into it. He'd been planning this for a while. This is not just a spontaneous moment in like, oh, you're leaving me. And oh, no, you're not. You know, we're gonna fight, we're gonna argue, we're gonna do this, X, Y, Z, and then one thing leads to another, and oh, shoot, you're dead. So you don't think he snapped? No, not at all. He planned this. Every major player we interviewed, I asked whether they believe Robert Fisher is dead or alive and either way, where he is now. I challenged them on their answers to try and learn how they got to their own conclusions. I think you'll be surprised by what they all have to say. Let's start with Hugh Lockerbie. I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't think he was still alive, Brianna. I honestly, I would not be wasting my time if I had evidence or if we had indication that he's deceased. You don't think there's any chance he's dead? Not right now, no, not at all. It's interesting, it's been a topic of... Oh yeah, everyone asks me all the time, oh, he's dead, Hugh, he's, you're wasting your time. No, I'm not. I'm not wasting my time at all. I have to believe, I have to, it's, I, I'm, not say obligated, but I'm, (laughs) I'm, I feel it is my duty and, and to, to figure out where he is. And if along that path I come across that now he's deceased, okay, then that's, 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 you know, that shows me that he is. But until this point, as we sit here today, I believe without a doubt, he is alive, he's on the run, he's integrated himself into somewhere that he can not put off those red flags. So Western US, maybe Canada, somewhere that he um, can do the things that he enjoys doing, hunt, fish. Um, he's got a new life, new family. You think he has a new family? Potentially, yeah, yeah. If we just peel back the onion a little bit, he had a domestic relationship with his wife that he murdered. Um, And one of the reasons why, you know, the emphasis was the divorce. And part of that divorce is the fact that he's out um, gallivanting with prostitutes and having massages and getting um, different sexual favors and having sexual relations. So, yeah, that need, that drive from a human drive standpoint, when you look at it from a psychology to human behavior standpoint, not going to be able to just turn it on, turn that off. So absolutely, he's got a new family. How does one live in 2022 like that? Like a whole different person with no trace. It just seems impossible now. Doesn't with it? everything we have, technology-wise, camera-wise, you name it. I mean, how do you think he's doing that then? If I knew, I would probably, <laughs> probably have him in custody, right? Um, Great question. Um, I wish I could give you an, a really good answer for that, and I don't know if I can, but somehow he's done it. Let's go back 15, 20 years, 2001, 2002. We're still using pagers. Cell phones just starting to really become the thing. I mean, internet existed, not used as like we use it now. Definitely no social media. Technology was just really starting to, that silicon push, that silicon life. He's able to use that as an advantage to 
assume a new identity and develop that within wherever, whatever uh, environment that he's in, that he's become to be known as that person. And then you have now the technology and cell phones and, and so social media, and now he's integrated into that. And he, it's just like he had already been that person years leading up to it. And it's just, it was, he was able to erase his previous life and never go back on the radar again. Hugh was and is so obviously passionate about this case. Years ago, he changed positions and handed off the case to Detective John Heinzelman, who is now the current lead on it. Let's just say they have completely different takes. Here's John. What do you think happened to him? And where is he now? I'm split on my opinion as to what happened. I want him to be alive. I want to be able to interview Robert Fisher. I want to be, be able to bring him to justice and bring closure to this case. Every year that this that it goes on and we don't have any verified uh, positive sightings that we can that we can look to leads me to believe that something else happened to him. That either he went up um, to Young and and took his own life or some tragedy befell him and he ended up He's long, he's been since dead, just from natural causes or, or other. I lean towards the fact that I don't think he's alive today. If you believe he is dead, where do you think his body is? If he went up there with the intent of, um, I'm just gonna, gonna camp for a while, and now that he realizes the police are here, he could easily have walked five miles in one direction and, and then either committed suicide or again something happened. We, we would have never been able to find him, especially if he went out onto the reservation because that's, that is a sovereign nation that we don't have rights to just, to just walk through, especially with, with weapons. So let me ask you this then, if he were to have either committed suicide or died pretty quickly, what would have been the point of taking out $280? He was effectively on the loose for 10 days. So the homicide happened sometime on the 9th. It was discovered on the morning of the 10th, and we found his vehicle on the 20th of April. And so in that time, um, that becomes another one of these mysteries. Was he planning on doing something with that he needed $200 for? Was he going to go, um, go to a bar and drink, but he didn't want to be tracked by his credit card? Was he gonna, did he need money for a, for a hotel or something that he was planning on staying at? So there's a, there's any number of things that he could have been thinking as to why do I take out this specific amount of money. Remember in episode three, retired detective TJ Duran, who was one of the first officers inside the Fisher family home after the explosion, told all of us up in Young how he got a call from a couple who swears they passed Robert Fisher walking on the old Young Road out toward the highway just a couple days after he went missing. What makes you think that that girl's tip, that she saw him, is credible and, and true. Her inflection when she was talking to me because I got annoyed because I was like, why didn't you call us the day you saw him? And I could tell by her response from me that she was, you know, sorry and she should have called. Just the way she responded to me, her inflection and her voice, she, I, I believed her. He could have walked south. He could walk north. He could walk west of us. There's so many possibilities. You know, and to be honest with you, if he shot himself in this cave, we would come. My belief was he walked out, especially after I talked to that couple that was driving on the young road. And there are detectives that believe he walked off and he killed himself. I believe he, he is the John List of our generation. He's out there, and whenever your documentary comes on, and if people on YouTube or people are watching it, there's gonna be somebody sitting there, and they're gonna say, that looks like Frank. But you know what? No, Frank wouldn't do that. It's the same thing with John List. So who knows? 50-50, he's alive. So let's say he is alive. Do you think he will ever be found or identified if he's alive? if he makes a mistake. What if he doesn't? I, I don't know, Brianna. I can't, there's no guarantees. It's so interesting to me how the detectives don't even agree. I think that's what makes this case even more alluring to people. 
TJ nailed it on the head. There are so many possibilities and people come up with their own conclusions, often based on the same set of limited facts. I asked Jesse Klingbeil what she thinks. She's the one who had the run-in with an old man at the Cherry Creek store, who pointed to Robert Fisher's wanted picture and said he was living at his ranch. Jesse has a lot of knowledge of the area in and around Young and the ranches in Northeast Arizona. Do you think he's still alive or do you think he's dead? I think he's alive. I think he's living his life. In Arizona? Maybe. Is it possible he could be on a ranch and the detectives never get to it? Sure. It's so wide open, so wild west. Sure, anything could happen, especially if he had a plan. You never do know who your neighbors are. That's definitely a haunting thought, but she's right. People consistently ask me and Sergio if we think Robert Fisher is dead or alive after everything we've learned in our investigation. We're both here in the podcast studio as I record this, so this is what we think. I can personally say I believe Robert Fisher is dead somewhere in Arizona. I don't have a specific theory on how I think he died other than likely suicide, but I just don't believe in 2022 somebody can live with a completely fraudulent identity and not be caught. And what else would he have to live for? The part I struggle with is if he is dead, I'm not sure his remains will ever be found. Northeast Arizona is so vast and so wooded, bones could easily be out of sight for good. Of course, I absolutely want him to be found, whether he's dead or alive, I just don't know what the reality is of that at this point. Here's Sergio's take. In past podcasts, I stated that I didn't believe Robert Fisher is alive. I truly thought he walked into the forest and killed himself. I referenced him as only an outdoorsy guy. But as this investigation unfolded, I realized he had an extensive survival resume. From his sister telling us when he was in the military, he would go spelunking often to Herb telling us Robert's hunting stories and discovering Robert's game trophy pictures. With all that being said, I changed my mind. I don't believe he walked into the wilderness and killed himself. I believe he, at the very least, walked out of the forest. Is he still alive? I just don't know. I saved Herb Greenbeck for last. This podcast season began with Herb's camping experience with Robert Fisher in the woods, and it's going to end with what he thinks happened. After all, he is the one who knew Robert Fisher and knew the Fisher family. He knew what he was gonna do. You think it was premeditated? Oh yes, absolutely, 100%. It was too too good. Look how many people do this and they can't get away with it. Well, there's no trace of him after that. So what is your theory of where he is now? Alive, dead, location, what do you think? Well, because I haven't found him, I'm gonna assume he's still alive. And he's, and he's living the way he wants to live with, with nobody around. Do you think he has a new family? No, no, I think he's a loner. I think he will, no. The, the best way not to get caught is don't involve other people. I think he killed the kids to get back at Mary. But the only reason to kill the kids is so they didn't have to go on in life with a divorced family. That seems to be the only possible theory that anybody can settle on is that he did not want them in We're some done. sort of separate. I created you, I take you away. And, and that, you know, we're not going to be a broken family, so we're just not going to have a family at all. That seems to be really the only reason. But, but to the normal person, that sounds insane. Do you think, though, that is the, the process he went with? The thought? The plan? I can only guess. I, I do think that that was the plan. I, I do. I, there was no other way to look at this. Depression, who knows? Maybe he went off and he wasn't going to... That was his solution. He couldn't see what we saw. Do you think he's in Arizona? Yeah, I would like to see him get caught. I don't think he'll get caught. Ever? No, he's not living, he's hiding. That's not living, he's in jail, just his own jail. But do you think he likes that? Yeah, he's a hermit. I think this was Robert's life, not Mary's life. I think Robert kinda charmed her in and she couldn't get out. You know, it's like a snake bite. It's too late.
If you have any information or credible tips on the whereabouts of Robert Fisher, please call the Scottsdale Police Department. You can also reach me on social media and message me information. Just search Brianna Whitney on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Any credible tips I've been receiving throughout this season, I've passed along to detectives to vet them out or have looked into them and investigated them myself. You've now heard the audio, but there is so much more footage we shot over the past six months that visually bring this investigation to life. You can watch the Finding Robert Fisher documentary on YouTube and azfamily.com. We've taken you along this investigation and journey every step of the way. Thank you for joining us and listening. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. This episode was edited by Mike Abbott. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, Finding Robert Fisher, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. 